Absolutely. So, uh, now a treat. Hello, Steve. I'm so happy to see you. Thank I'm, you. I, I, I hope you weren't overhearing too much of the gushing earlier. I'm sure you really couldn't help it too much, but I mean... You're very, very kind. Well, I mean, you know, this is, this is always a treat for me. It always has been, and we've had these conversations a number of times now. And, we have. And, and yet there's always something new to say. And the thing that I want... I mean, first off, we need to talk about the repertory that you're going to be mm -hmm. playing. Yes. But um, I also want to talk just about Ojai, because yes, yeah. you are part of the extended family here at Ojai. You have become, uh, to me, as, as invaluable as anybody who participates. And you surely must have feelings on this being Tom Morris's final year. I do, indeed. You know, Tom has been such an important friend, uh, a mentor, and an artistic leader, not just in Ojai, but of course we are talking about Ojai. And so what Tom has done here for the community here and for the artists who have been nurtured by this festival and this program is just extraordinary. And actually to have watched Tom himself grow over the course of his tenure, to see him explore new ideas, fearlessly taking on music and musical ideas that he he came to later in life. It right, has been right, a, absolutely. an absolute model for us all to know that there are discoveries around absolutely every corner. Yes, yes, absolutely so. And. Um, you know, I, I, it's 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 interesting to me too um, that this has been sort of you've you've come in here as a percussionist, mm -hmm. which is how so many people know you. But then you've been able to extend your conducting career here as well, and and yes. and very richly so. And so the. That's sort of a, a, a tongue-tied pivot point to the mm. to the grisé, which I right. mean, I, how about you say the French? The quatre chambres pour franchir le seuil. Doesn't he make it look easy <laughs> and it sounds beautiful? I mean, this is music for th for crossing the right. threshold. What's the idea? Well, the threshold, of course, is the th is the boundary between life and death. Right. But rather than seeing it as solely a lamentation, and this was what Grisé thought himself, in spite of the fact that. Tragically and ironically, it became his own requiem. Right, right. We see embedded in darkness these sparks of hope. We see in the, 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 in some cases, the darkness of the Grisé orchestration, these glimmers of luminosity. And so I feel this kind of cross-wiring across the threshold in the, in the entirety of the piece. And of course, what one always says about Grisé is his uh, career as a spectralist. Um, and I'm not sure how interesting that is, except to say that everything grows from a germinal moment in that piece. So right. you can hear chords which are carefully orchestrated and balanced, timbres which pass across the ensemble, and you think, what an extraordinary moment that is. And yet you know that it's rooted. It's embedded in a kind of language that he developed his entire life. Well, that, that, that's a very, very good point, actually, and one that I hadn't actually thought to script out my thinking on. But, I mean, what what is sort of the nutshell definition of spectralism for people who are coming to this who may never have even heard the term? Well, sound is a complexity. And sound, any any given sound, with the exception of a sine tone, consists of a basic frequency, the, the thing that we call a note and that right. we hear, but that the coloristic aspects of that come from the harmonic spectrum that every single sound produces. That harmonic spectrum has its roots, of course, in Pythagoras and in, in the way naturally recurring vibrations relate to one another. So by, in essence, by analyzing that, by taking that as a template and mapping those proportions and those ideas onto broader palettes, mm -hmm. such as harmony or rhythm or even color, there is this strong and inextricable link between the surface of the music and the most basic aspect of musical language, and that is the tone and the physical construction of vibrations. Right. And this is something that actually leads us very nicely to the John Luther Adams piece, yes. because those pieces are, are deceptive in, in the sense of you think, okay, a, a series of pieces for solo percussion and solo percussion instrument, and I could hear coming from over there mm. earlier, there, there was uh, the sound of a snare drum, and I said, okay, have we started? Is that, the, okay, that's the first of the concerts, and then there was a tam-tam piece yes. as well, I believe. And so, again, you're, you're coming from something where there's one basic, simple, elemental idea, but, again, what you 
complicit with John Luther Adams are doing is teasing out all of the complexity in every one of those elemental ideas. Well, if you don't mind, I would like to tell you the story about how this piece came to Please, be. Please, absolutely. Which is that I knew John from having played others of, other of his percussion music, but we didn't know each other well. And okay. I had a concert in Fairbanks at the University of Alaska, and I made a point to make sure that John was there because I wanted him to write a piece, a solo piece for me. And, mm -hmm. and what I had in mind was like a, a nine minute piece for wood blocks, <laughs> and, you know. And we, this was in the middle of the winter and we sat in his studio and at two o'clock in the afternoon, the Alaska range to the south was getting dark. Mm -hmm. And we watched the light fade and we talked about music and we talked about baseball, we talked about single malt whiskey, we talked about all the things that we share <laughs> in common. And um, at the end of that, time that seven minute piece had grown into an 85 minute piece for solo a percussionist with electronic enhancements that John calls auras. Those mm -hmm. are pre-recorded tracks that he has treated. Right. But what I realized at that moment is that whereas many composers begin with a blank page and add notes, John begins with the totality of noise and starts to pare it away. He starts to fenestrate it so that there are holes in it and there's texture and it's aerated and there are moments of silence, for example, mm -hmm. long moments of silence mm -hmm. in, the, in the percussion solo that come as a result of so carving away the noise that one is in fact left with silence. But just like the Henry Moore sculptures, you are aware that he is shaping silence around noise. Wow. And it is extraordinary. And I play that piece now pretty regularly since its, um, you know, its premiere was in 2002. Right. It's not a, no longer a new piece. And every single time I think about the Tam Tam movement, for example, this is the most beautiful and luminous music I know strong statement but 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 i think absolutely defensible and, yeah and there is something about uh, and and again as i was just saying about uh stephen having uh, a long and fruitful relationship now with ohi so has has john's music Ooh, yes. become part of the fabric and and the the sound and feel of ohi at least for me in terms of i mean several major pieces have been done here now and I mean, last year the the string quartet was done, I believe, as as a community offering after the fires. Yes, that's right. So, and it's a gorgeous, that's a gorgeous piece. We presented that also at Banff Center, where Claire Chase and I run the summer music right, program right. on top of Tunnel Mountain, and it was <laughs> another extraordinary moment. But yes, John has made a home here, uh, yeah. in, musically speaking. Absolutely, and, and and I'm happy to be a part of that. Yeah. Now, uh, sort of, I I mean, I. I I was just about to say at an extreme opposite, but it's not really. It's no. all just kind of a continuum. So, let's talk a little bit about the the James Dillon right. piece, La, La Coupure, which is it's from the the longer rivers set, right. is it not? It's a it's the central movement, the central hour. Yeah. Of the central hour, hour of uh, nine <laughs> rivers, which right. is of, as it as the name would imply, nine pieces, and That's La Coupure right. is the middle of it. It means La Coupure means the cut. And so there are cuts and pastings of both music and video elements. Okay. The piece consists of a, a, a 19 short movements between two and four minutes in length, which I've organized with, with James. And then at these fascinating moments, you create collages by cutting and pasting literally from amongst the 19. So for example, I could be standing at the vibraphone, but I could quote a moment from a drum movement or okay. I could be at the drums and quote a little bit from a vibraphone or a gong moment and and so you literally cut three to five second snippets of the pre-existing <laughs> music and put it together which is interesting because mm -hmm. the piece has to be memorized because of that you have to be able to move in memory through all these kinds of wow. things. Wow, okay. And so then to cut and paste out of sequence spontaneously without planning that and without any improvisation simply grabbing it is a really an extraordinary feeling to be, to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what what is what is the video component? Because I know you have two video ar artists working with you on that. Ross Carr, uh, who is a um, collaborator, he is now one of the artistic directors of the International Contemporary Ensemble. Yes, created a really beautiful video projection uh, of basically of Southern California. Ross was a student at UC San Diego okay. when we first did this piece okay. in preparation for uh, the Holland Festival performances and mm -hmm. in James's 60th birthday. So much of the video is made from scenes of Southern California, Los Angeles, etc. And they, those video images are cut by oddly shaped screens, which in fact cut through the performance space. So the idea of cutting exists in a lot of different ways mm -hmm. in that piece, yeah. Okay. So 
Earlier today, I did have the the real treat of hearing Barbara Hannigan getting about as fanish about you as I was just a few oh, minutes no. ago on camera, where she said she had first encountered your work as a percussionist when she was around 19 and had mm -hmm. just come to really so admire your your prowess as a performer. And so I want to know, I mean, have you worked with Barbara before no, now? No, I, I is, certainly know, I mean, I know her work. You know her well, work. Of course, but sure. we, this is the first time we've worked together. And there's an interesting little point of intersection. Barbara told me about that concert. I remember it very clearly. And it was just before that concert that I was on the phone with John Luther Adams, walking around, in, in essence, the music center in Toronto, <laughs> talking about the piece that would eventually become Inuksuit. So there's this amazing confluence of energies that surround that concert with Barbara there and John on my mind and the entirety of the Ojai Festival this year. But to work with Barbara, especially to do that, extraordinary piece of Grisé with her is really a dream. This is, I would have moved heaven and earth to be here to do that. And, um, and it, it is living up to every expectation, as, as high as those expectations were. And she's an extraordinary artist. Extraordinary. So I, I guess where, where I would, would end it all is just by linking these things together, the, the, the Grisé concert with Barbara and La Coupure and and the the JLA pieces out on the lawn and just thinking, what is it about Ojai, not 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 even just Tom, but what is it about Ojai, this this atmosphere, this environment, and this audience that makes all of these things not only possible but palatable, accepted, and enthusiastically drunk in? Well, you know, the thing about any place is the people who, who come to that place. Of course, this is a gorgeous spot of the universe. Yes, and it, it has power. <laughs> There's no question about it. The, the land here has power. But the confluence of the, of, of the energy of the people, this gorgeous place, and the, the willingness and openness, not just the openness, but the need to think deeper, to probe more, to be more open, is a part of Ojai and... I mean, we've had lots of conversations, uh, most of them on camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, we'll have to change that. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you've been all over the world. You've seen these, these kinds of festivals, and so have I, and I've never been any place that feels like this. No, no, not, 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 not exactly like this no. in, in terms of the, just the, the generosity of reception yeah. and the warmth and just the real open-mindedness. Mm. And I think, you know, one of, one of the tests for that, and I... I we could sit here and name examples mm -hmm. all day long, but the thing that all continues to resonate for me is being here two years ago during Vijay Iyer's year mm -hmm. at 11 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday with George Lewis and Muhal Richard no, Abrams gosh. and Roscoe Mitchell improvising, <laughs> uncompromising, really, really yeah. rigorous going for it. And Libby Bowl is full, full. and everybody is wrapped. Yep. And I heard later from one of the administrators here that his wife, who had never encountered these performers or this music before, was in tears by how yeah. moved and how powerful an experience it was. Are, are there things like that that you would single out as being particular magic spots? Well, I, I, I would say in general, and then I have one specific thing, mm -hmm. that in Ojai, one is aware that music is a tool for exploration and not just the execution of a concert. It is the way of illuminating our lives and examining where we are and why we are living in the way we are. And that seems really evident here. The moment I was thinking of was, in fact, in the year that I was music director, we finished on Libby Bowl stage at a little after midnight with Appalachian Spring, and then for, for reasons that now escape me, started at five o'clock the next morning <laughs> with, for Philip Gustin, a right. four and a half hour long Morton Feldman piece, and I thought, nobody will be there. <laughs> well, sure, of course. And I walked into that space, and there were 70 people who had slept all night on the floor <laughs> not to miss it, and I thought, you have come to the right place, <laughs> my friend. And, and it was that extraordinary moment of, yeah, of wanting not to miss anything, soaking it all up, and then using music for the betterment of our lives. Are, are there things that you are particularly looking forward to in this particular festival, apart from the things you are participating in? I mean, I, I, not to put you on the spot, but you know, I mean, my co-host was saying, what are you looking for? Well, this by Zorn and that by Zorn, yeah, but course. there's that and this and that. But is there anything that, that strikes you as, 
wow, I've really been wanting to hear that, and now here's my opportunity. Well, partly I'm hearing Barbara's elegant uh, direction of Stravinsky's pungent score. That's a fantastic thing. Isn't it? And I want to hear her Haydn. I'm really, really intrigued. I know her Haydn conducting, and I'm very, very eager to hear the La Passione. Yeah, yeah. I really, I, I loved what she was talking about, again, in the, in the afternoon chat, where she approaches the the art of being a conductor as being a collaborator and mm -hmm. asking the musicians please tell me what works for you and she cited a particular Haydn movement that begins with a very syncopated offbeat kind of thing yeah. and from orchestra to orchestra players would tell her what worked in terms yeah. of just cueing that moment and it seems so revelatory because we grow up thinking about and I, I certainly don't need to tell you this because I'm, I'm, I'm sure that it's been part of your experience getting into conducting as well. You're a collaborative musician. We, this is what music is. It is the sound people make when they come together. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, as a comment about mid-period Haydn, there's very little more experimental music than that. I mean, when he was with in, in the Esterhazy household, he used that to explore everything that he could do. Sure. And so this belongs side by side with Brise, and it belongs side by side with, uh, with all of the rest of the pieces that we have. And it belongs side by side with Zorn in terms yeah, of, of the, the, the inventiveness, but also sort of the, I mean, in a lot of Haydn, there's this sort of streak of impudent humor. And, oh, and I mean, even, yeah. even a kind of, you know, just like really, really champing at the bit, feeling constrained by being the employee and wanting to yeah. really spread his wings. You know, he had a, he had a sports car and he wanted to see how, <laughs> how fast <laughs> it would take the corners. You know? <laughs> right, exactly. And, you know, so we do have, uh, you know, the, the, the second act and the third act of, of Rake's Progress coming yes. up. And again, I was just, I, I, I don't know if it was in earshot if you were coming over here yet, but I'm just noticing so many things that I've just never really paid attention to mm. in the score before. I mean, I, you, you know the parts, you know the characters, you know the, the storyline, but, you know, I was really listening deeply to, to Anne True Love's oh, yeah. aria Amazing, and right? hearing it as a conversation with mm. that solo bassoon yep. player. Yep. Or the richness and the pungency of the wind writing mm -hmm. in, in the, the, the point at which Nick Shadow is really seducing Tom to the dark side. And I just think, well, it, partly it's because the orchestra is exposed on the platform, yes. and partly it's because Stravinsky was, in fact, an ingenious composer. But I think that, absolutely, I'm, I'm picking up on things because Barbara is pointing them out. Yes, no, that's very true. And those moments of clarity after the pungency, both harmonic and, 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 and orchestrational, then to find those things and we see them unfold and it's, it's really delightful. I'm also very eager to see what happens next. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a, a, a tremendous treat to hear the rest of this. And, and she mentioned too that, um, you know, I, she said that the first time that she had been engaged as a conductor, um, it had spun out of the fact that she was doing uh, Ligeti's uh, Mysteries of the Macabre all over the world. And somebody said, well, you sing like a conductor. And she said, well, what does that mean? And she said, well, you, you, you sing with a, a, a sort of focus that lets the musicians know what you want them to do around you and how you yeah. want them to respond to you. And so somebody, after, after enough people had said, you sing like a conductor, somebody said, why don't you just do this? You need to do this for yourself. And so half of the concert, she explained, was the Ligeti, was, was Mysteries of the Macabre, which right. she sang and conducted. And there's brilliant video of this oh, happening. Oh, yes, I know it very well. But the other half was Reynard, because somebody oh, really? said, I didn't know Stravinsky, that, yeah. it, it, there's something about the rhythmic specificity and the fact that she's very good with continuity and transitions. And so Reynard was part of that yeah, very fantastic. first program in 2011 and so it feels like there's this real sort of familial through line and it, it amazes me even more it's sort of that feeling when you go to the village vanguard mm -hmm. and you know that john coltrane's ghost is in the corner <laughs> yeah, yeah, and right. you can kind of get that here thinking well stravinsky was here right over there. <laughs> yeah and you know it's uh, there are all these ties to yes. to california and to the the california um community the extended right. community of of composers who ended up here after World War II, or during World War II, I should say. Right. Um, 
the when, I, I, when, I when I would visit yeah. Betty Freeman when she was still alive, she would say, oh, Steve, dear, why don't you drive by the Studinsky house when you're done here? <laughs> <laughs> That's truly, truly, yeah. I, just amazing, the, the sense of history yeah. and the sense of, 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 of a living engagement with the history, that everything is not there just to be genuflected to and monumentalized, but that it's all there for interrogation. I mean, rather mm. violently last season, you, you, you might recall, with, with the way that Patricia Kopenchinskaya was engaging these things. And um, so now we get to hear, uh, again, the extraordinary Barbara Hannigan getting ready to come out for the final two acts of um, The Rake's Progress with Stravinsky. But thank you so much, oh, Stephen please. Schick, for coming and talking it's to us. It's my great pleasure, as always, Steve. Thank, you, thank very you very much. much. And there are, there are two more segments, if you, were, if you will, of the John Luther Adams Mathematics of Resonant Bodies coming up tomorrow afternoon and then on Saturday afternoon. Um, then the, uh, the early morning concert, the Le Cocour, is Saturday, Saturday morning is. at 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, remind me just off the top of my head, because I'm juggling a lot of things, mm, the, the Grise is... Saturday evening. Saturday evening. Yes. Okay, so we have quite the full schedule. We and, do. <laughs> and now uh, we're, we're getting ready to that's send it right make, back down to the... That's what makes it all high. Indeed. <laughs>